Welcome, Dr. Eager. Thank you. It's a great, great pleasure and a profound honor to have you with me today here on this couch talking about the gift of freedom. Yes. What do you think about that? I love that word. I'm really hung up on how to free oneself from the concentration camp that is in your own mind and how to find the key right in your pocket. The key right in your pocket? Yes. Can you tell me more about it? And maybe Oh, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Uh, when I was talking to my, my granddaughter about the Wizard of Oz, that you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to look for the wizard because everything you have within you and how to reclaim that part, how to reclaim our innocence and acknowledge that we're born with love and love conquers all. Do you also say then that part of people being unlucky and unhappy is because they are looking for things outside themselves? Absolutely. The more you wait for things to happen outside of yourself, the more you begin and continue to be a victim rather than a survivor. And to hear this from you, Dr. Eager, um, mm -hmm. out of your mouth is mm -hmm. quite special and quite peculiar in a way, because your history is of actually having survived at the concentration camp, uh, Auschwitz. We don't appreciate, you know, what we have. Even a, a slightest cold, you know, we think the world is over. Everything is temporary. And I'm not only blessed that I survived, I'm also blessed that my name is Dr. Edith Eva Eager and I can guide others also to be truly free. So I couldn't be happier that I have a very purpose for life. Mm -hmm. I will never ever retire. I will also finish every bit of food on my plate. I don't want to waste anything. I finish your food. <laughs> you know, yesterday I was sharing my food yes. because too much for me to order just by myself to eat. So you either eat yourself or you share. So the first yeah, thing yeah. I ask, do you want to share? Do yeah. you, doesn't matter about the money. I used to be associated with a psychiatrist, psychiatrist uh, from Johns Hopkins, uh, the head of the US Army psychiatry. And we would talk about patients and he would order many things and just pick on it and pick on it. So pretty soon, I stopped ordering anything. I just ate up his leftovers. <laughs> Nothing to do with money, really. It just pains me to throw to away yeah. even a piece of bread. Is that for you something you learned in Auschwitz to be very careful about your food? Very careful about the food. Every crumb. My sister suffered more than I did. I was very skinny, but I was a gymnast. You know, I was strong. Mm. She suffered more from hunger, so I would eat the soup, which was filled with medicine. Mm. I never remember crying in Auschwitz. Never? No, people asked me, you know, did you cry? And I was void of emotions. Where did they go? Where did they stay, those emotions? Well, we were just uh, like a herd. We never knew what's going to happen, especially when we took a shower. Mm -hmm. We were wondering whether gas is going to come out or water is going to come out. So that's the really big difference between stress and distress. Mm -hmm. I think stress is fine. Where I am and where I'm going to go tomorrow, I'm asking you. Um, but this stress when I don't know what's going to happen next. So you say you were in Auschwitz, you were void of emotions. 
And when you um, when you wrote the book, the choice which we have here, I in, cried in front buckets. Of it, yes. Why, why did you cry when you wrote the book? Because I was able to give myself permission, not just talk about the feeling, but to actually feel that feeling. What's the difference? Oh, there's a big difference that you don't medicate your feeling, that you don't try to intellectualize or try to impress other people about your knowledge. Um, the grieving is truly the best thing because it leads to healing. So are you saying when you put words to painful experience, that yes. is actually the process of grieving? It is, and it's about the gratitude that no matter what, you made it. So the question is, what now? Not uh, why me? So what now? And you, you talk about gratitude. So when, when do you I, know that you reached gratitude? How, how do you experience that? You know, people usually ask me, are you preparing for this speech or that speech? speech? And I say, you know, God talks to my heart and I'm never really aware what I will say or prepare. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. My late husband asked me at a keynote address in New Zealand when we were actually honoring the righteous Gentiles, <coughs> like Coritian Boone, the people who were hiding Jewish lives. And it was very, very formal. And my late husband asked me, what are you going to say? And I said, I don't know until I say it. That's exactly how I do. And so that's about living in the present. <coughs> totally. And, and trusting okay. that, that comes what will come. And think with hope. Never give up hope. What was a moment in your life after Auschwitz that hope became important again? Yeah. Things became very bad. I was a slave laborer and I practically walked through city after city as the Americans came on one side, the Russians. We were moved and we carried ammunition on a train. We worked in fa factories and, and we ended up in a place called Mauthausen. And from there I survived what is referred today the death march. Mm -hmm. And when we arrived in Gunskirchen, animal, it was cannibalism. That was the worst thing that I don't wish for anyone. Mm -hmm. And when I saw people eating other people's flesh, I asked people to see the movie called The Sound of Music, because I am in Austria and and I look at God, I don't know how to touch human flesh. And God pointed for me to look down and I still had grass to eat. And I'm remembering picking one blade of grass over and against the other. So when people say I can't, when I am in a classroom, that's the first thing I put on the board. I can't. And then I take the apostrophe and I take the T and I erase it and I say, I can. Why? Because I think I can. Like a choo choo train. I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> how, how do you climb Mount Everest? One step at a time. So that's really so in, so in these. That marshes you discover the power of thoughts and the power, the power. There was a Hungarian woman who was in jail by the communists for eight years. And she said in eight years she climbed Mount Everest from one side of the little place where she was to the other. 
and she was counting every step. Mm -hmm. And she said, in eight years, she managed to climb Mount Everett. Wow. So it's what happens with yeah. what you have. Yeah. And everything in life is a gift. So you describe it uh, profoundly and, and in, in your book, The Choice, and you wrote it uh, when you were 90 years old. So you were very young when you wrote this book. Yes, I was in my late 80s, but it actually takes a lifetime. Yeah, wh takes a why? Lifetime. Why now? Uh, I decided that I owe it to my parents because I am one of the youngest survivors. And if I will not do it, who will? And then I remember Philip Zimbardo, who calls himself my baby brother, said, you know, Holocaust survivors who are famous are all men. We need a female voice, he said. And you are the female voice of Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very grateful that I met Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Well, he was in his 70s, and I managed to write an article that was published, Viktor Frankl and me. And someone sent it to him to Vienna. And one day I get a letter from Viktor Frankl, well, who wants to meet me in San Diego at the International University. And he invited me to come and hear him lecturing. Do you do you have memories of that of that the first I, time you I, saw him? You know, I thought I had a, a, that I was facing the Pope. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. So he was yes. so important for you. It was so important. Yeah. I, I just, you know, people tell me now, oh, I just I feel so honored to meet you, and I'm thinking me. <laughs> Little of me. <laughs> yes, I felt very honored, and and I was fascinating in uh, in the book because I had no meaning and purpose when I was liberated. I had nothing to get up for, so I didn't say what when I got up. I said what for. And when did That's you? That's meaninglessness. Yeah. When did you find the new meaning in your life? When I began to work with Vietnam veterans, I had two paraplegics, same symptomatology, same diagnosis, same prognosis. And one of them was kind of in a fetal position. Why me? angry, cursing, God, country. Conversely, the other one says to me, you know, Doc, I'm sitting in a wheelchair and I'm so grateful that God gave me a second chance in life. I can see the children's eyes much closer. I can see the flowers. And I am, with a white coat, Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatry, and I feel like the biggest fake, because I had a 16-year-old in me, realizing that I cannot take them further than I have gone myself. And I decided to go back to Auschwitz. So I am more and more grateful to the Vietnam veterans. Yeah. So they invited you to take to, your journey. That's right. Yeah. So I, what, what, I, what happened when you were back in Auschwitz? How was that for you? I think it was the most positive experience for me. I couldn't do it in a therapist's office. I, and I needed to go back there and smell the smell, and um, somebody asked me whether there were birds in Auschwitz. 
I have yet to see a bird in Auschwitz. And even today, people tell me there are no birds in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was a journey that really changed my whole view of what it is to do therapy. Mm -hmm. That so, you got to, you got to, not to run from the past, not to fight it, to face it. So going back to Auschwitz yourself, really for you was a rebirth, a rebirth, a and, total yeah, rebirth, and also it put you in the, in a in a in a place. It empowered you to also take others on their journey to yes. really face the past. Yeah, that is the whipped cream and the cherry on the top. <laughs> that you not only survived barely, I don't even like that word anymore. Okay. You know, that I'm a survivor. Uh, You're a thriver. I I, I'm a thriver. I'm, yes, I like that much better than, well, I barely survived. Yeah. Well, I liked it the other day when you, when you told me, you said, we, we don't have to go to a shrink, we have to go to a stretch. <laughs> yes, 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 I, I think, uh, to really take a risk. To take a risk. A risk is a wonderful four-letter word. And I rather risk and suffer. So if I come to you after a lecture and I tell you that I'd like to get to know you and I hope you would like to get to know me, and you tell me that I really don't want to get to know you. So I'm going to tell you that rejection is just an English word that people make up when your expectations are not met. Okay. No one can reject me but me. Mm -hmm. So I'm really paying attention how people pay attention what they say when they talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. Like I always do that, I'm never going to get better and, and uh, how to really say that I have choices. Yeah, so the, these sound for you like victim positions. I can never, exactly. I will never. Exactly, the victim, you cannot be a victim without a victimizer. Mm -hmm. They find each other. So when you came back from Auschwitz, did that also change the way of your therapy? Totally. Okay, so totally. in what way? In what way, uh, because I, I decided to be a compassionate listener, not to ever give any advice, to be able to just really guiding someone who is willing, it's a good word, willing, to be willing to go through the valley of the shadow of death, to go through the dark tunnel you can't go under it or over it. You got to go through it mm -hmm. towards the light. I like to work people, especially couples, to work toward, towards each other rather than moving away from each mm -hmm. other. I like the idea of coupleship, yeah. that, uh, that they learn to compromise and most of all, Couples learn how to negotiate. Mm. Why is that so important, negotiation? So if you ask me about something, about something, uh, I want you to do this, this, and that, and I'm going to see what's in it for me. And then I'll tell you what you can count on and where I am no longer. So doing it, some things yeah. that I'm um, not able physically, yeah. especially physically. Yeah. So negotiation is also about being able to express your needs. I do, and honestly, as much as possible, yeah. so you can make a deal, so we don't have unrealistic expectations. Okay. So could you then say that in order to become, for you to become that compassionate listener, Mm -hmm. You had to first compassionately listen to yes. your own emotions that you had experienced okay. in Auschwitz as well. Yeah. My self-dialogue is so important. When I get up in the morning 
and look in the mirror and say, Edie, I love you. It's not narcissistic. Believe me, to start the day with self-love, which is self-care, which is not narcissistic. It makes a difference if you leave the house saying, I love you, I love myself. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah. in the evening, I'm going to feel satisfied because life is just one day. Life is just one day. That morning sunshine doesn't come back. <laughs> That's Every beautiful. moment is pressure. Yeah. Do you think too many people are not realizing that enough? I don't think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there is a voice in us that... We have temptation to do things that is really not very good for our health. Mm -hmm. And they say, just this time, the hell with it. Life is short. Mm -hmm. So the temptation God gave us, you know why? So you can practice the freedom of choice. Do you still have to practice that freedom, being 91? You got it. And I never have been more effective as I am now. How do you know that you I are... see it, I feel it. Okay. I create that atmosphere, that climate, that when you come here, you're never going to be the same. Mm. So never what... going to be the same. Mm. You do maybe the same thing, but not the same way. Yeah. So you that's... switch gears. Yeah, that's the value of practicing and staying curious. Practice. It's what you practice, that's what you're going to be. That's what you're going to be. And the way you think, that's how you're going to feel. Okay. So that's really about being able to lead yourself. To be a good parent to you, yes. And to be a good parent to yes. yourself. Yes, someone asked me to sign the book. I want you to dedicate it to my inner child. <laughs> a young man came to me, said, I want to do it to the inner child. There is a little boy in you. There is a little girl in me. And we show up for them because their mind is not developed until you're 25. Mm -hmm. And so I beg young people not to use because you interfere with the natural development of your brain. Mm -hmm. The temptation God gave us so we can practice the freedom of choice. What would you then say to, because I, I see many parents nowadays and leaders in organizations as well, di having difficulties with children, but also with employees. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole idea of delayed gratification is, is a difficult idea for many mm -hmm. people. They want to have it now. And if they don't have it now... And they want it easy. And they want it easy. They want it easy and they want it now. They would never make it in Auschwitz. Life is not easy. I'll make it easier. But life is not easy. So I think it's very important for you not to do for the child what the child needs to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. Even if it takes you two seconds to tie your shoe, okay, it takes the child an hour. But if you do it for them, you cripple them. Yeah, so a child has to learn how it is to fail as well. How to, uh, you know, the immigrants who came to America, they lived in a ghetto. They were sweeping uh, streets and factories and Levi Strauss, you know, they were in a ghetto sewing and look what happened. The children became Levi Strauss. Yeah. I never forget that Leonard Bernstein's father was interviewed and said someone to him, why do you discourage your son to study piano? And he said, I never thought he's going to grow up to be Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he wanted his son to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a CPA. Yeah. That was the dream of the immigrant. Yeah. So he didn't see that talent in, in, in Leonard. No, didn't yeah. see that talent. Yeah. Is it important to spot talent in people also yeah. as parents? So you see also, uh, if Einstein would not come to this country, I don't know what would have happened mm -hmm. in World War II. So America is the 
country of immigrants. Yeah. Yes. So what would you then tell to people who say, yes, but if, if I try and if I, mm -hmm. if I stumble, it's also, it's painful and I dislike the pain because I don't know how to deal with pain. What do yeah. you tell them? I say that, is it possible that you're going to do every day something that you have previously avoided? How about going to the grocery store and pick up a tomato and talk to someone? <laughs> the fear comes right there with me. So that's what you do. Or maybe go to a, gr a, a restaurant and the waiter comes to you and wants to give you more coffee and you say to the waiter, can't you see I already have some? Just be nasty to a waiter. Just go through the experience and make decisions about change. So because if you don't change, you don't grow. Yeah. So and in change and in growth, learning and being curious and sending, yeah. sending different signals to your own brain becomes very important. Absolutely. It's all about, it's all about that frontal lobe that we develop. So the brain needs new learnings. Yes. Yeah. The synapse and how they connect to each other is a lot to be said about the brain. Mm -hmm. And many, many studies are being done now. I'm so happy that you really have to know who you're talking to. Mm. Yeah. So how do you stay curious at the age of 91 and having such a immense career already behind you and you hold an active practice you are seeing patients almost on a daily basis you got it how how do you do it how do you keep so my patients are my children and i want to be used up what does that mean? To Nothing be used worse up? than being an unused <laughs> woman. Yeah. I, I like to be used up. I go dancing once a week, and it's Sunday, and it's the big band, and keep dancing. It's very good. I go to the Arts Club, and my boyfriend is not well, and. Uh, he said, in three weeks, we're going to go back dancing again. Okay. And, and, I, and I danced the swing, and I love Tommy Dorsey, and I love the people who studied the big band. So I am in that generation. You can have your rock and then roll, and then you can hear music, and I have my music. You have your big band. Yes, I love the big band. Yeah, yes. yeah. So... To stay on listening to music, doing new things. Yeah. Have you seen the movie The Scent of a Woman? Yes, I have. Oh my God, that tango. Sensuous is different than sexy. Sensuous means beautiful. And I like that when we empower each other, hmm. that you can be you and I can be I. But together, you know, we can be so, so much stronger. Is that something you can learn, you think, to like beauty, to have an eye for beauty? Yes, you can. Some things you can learn it, but you cannot teach it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to find words, how to really say one from another or the together, learning and teaching. But you cannot teach anything to anyone unless they have the desire to learn. Mm. So I like in schools for the children to love the love of learning, mm -hmm. not because they're afraid to get a bad report card. Mm. So they cheat. So as you are learning a lot yourself, somewhere you have contact with that inner child within you. That, that, that Oh, I'm that. telling you, I tell the inner child, you can be a little child, it's fine. I am here, the healthy one. I'm the adult, and I'm going to protect you and take care of you. 
I'm never going to ever hmm. abandon you. What yeah. is something you would like to learn still? Right now, I would like to learn more about uniting. I like to study more languages, like Chinese, like really, I was in Mexico City, and I was loved so beautifully. I spoke to the YPO, I spoke to the Jewish community. I never felt so loved just for me. I think love is the answer. Love is the answer, and language is a Lang means of communicating love. It's a means, love. yes. Yeah. See, everybody speaks like, uh, English wherever you go. Mm. But I'm so grateful when the Americans go and speak the language of the country. Okay, so I have, have the willingness. Yeah. Willingness. You've got to be willing to be willing. And so I have yet to arrive. You've yet to arrive, and I might take you once on a journey to learn a little Dutch. I'm here, and, <laughs> and I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm called the Anne Frank who didn't die. And I want to say, I was just like you at 14. I was in love too, and I had dreams, and knowing, even when she was writing her diary, remember she said, even I'm looking outside and I see people murdered and there is nothing but hatred. And she still says, I believe that people are basically good. And, and love is going to come and peace is going to, and I said to myself, that's exactly where I was in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. I knew it is temporary, yeah. and I knew I'm going to make it. So that's a belief you share with Anne Frank. I share with Anne Frank because my schooling was just like hers. I studied Latin and Greek. My late husband fell in love with me because I was in a TB hospital, and he was very impressed that I knew the Greek gods and goddesses, <laughs> and I knew Latin. You know, he fell in love with me being such an erudite teenager. You know, I never finished high school, and I graduated with honors, so it just shows you that uh, if there is willingness, you can make it. And even at midlife, I tell people there is no such thing as a crisis. There is a transition. And there is no such word as a problem. There is only a challenge. There's only a challenge. There are no problems. There are only challenges. Mm -hmm. There are no crises. There is only a transition. A transition where you have to let go of things. The second hand of your life. Yes. Yeah, that's a yeah. wonderful thing. And so if we, if we draw our togetherness now on this couch to a close, yeah. and if, if we think about transition, what, what is, for the people that are watching, what is something you would like to share with them when it comes to transition that is really important for you? That there is a creator that put us here for a purpose. And so I came to celebrate that each of us are one of a kind, unique diamond in a rough. There'll never ever be another you or me. And just like Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. And you do it your way. Mine is not better or worse than yours. And that's why to give up the need for jealousy and instead of using words like self-esteem, 
I like to say self-confident, that, you know, I'm well put together. I am uh, congruent. Mm -hmm. And I like to speak to the heart. And so you have Your been heart. talking to the heart in the, in the past moments we've been able to share. Yeah. the beautiful diamond that you are. Uh, so thank you for the gift of sharing your story with thank us. Thank you for being such a brilliant interviewer well, thank and you. arranging for me to come here from California to this land here so we can really dream together to form a human family. So we are doing. So we can survive. Uh, thank you. Finally. Yes. Thank you. I thank you. And I wish you uh, safe uh, new journeys and a lot of learnings. Yes, the best is yet to be. The best is yet to be. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.